Buenos días. Yo trato de uh, 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 envío bienvenido, uh, uh, but I'm going to continue this in, Sp in English because <laughs> my, my Spanish from the corners of New York will not carry me that far. But I am going to be talking about a cell that is not only important for your immune defense, it's also important for how your tissue is structured. Um, the mast cells were identified back in the 1800s and largely had been forgotten about until about the 1980s. And now we understand that this cell is not only involved in allergies, but is extremely important in autoimmune disorders, connective tissue disorders. Excuse me. and structure. So we're going to start off with the basics. And we're going to talk about the importance of balance and homeostasis, where every minute of every hour of every day, you need to keep your water, your nutrients, your waste products, your salts, all within a certain limit of time, a certain balance. And if you go out of balance is when you're going to, be, you're going to feel unwell. Crucial to this is your immune system, because you're going to be having challenges from within as well as from without. And there was a German philosopher named Peter Sloterdijk, who basically said that we are all born with immune systems that can be defined a priori as embodied expectations of injury and corresponding programs of protection as well as repair. And at the front line of this, are our borders. So I'm going to use the analogy of a city-state, where you have a wall around a city, around a community. And whether you're talking about the Great Wall of China or enclosed communities in a city, you're talking about the ability of keeping things in and keeping things out. But the Chinese, as well as modern communities today, found that fences and walls only offer you a limited amount of protection. And you have to have guards on the walls that can act as uh, sentries looking for dangers and then containing that danger and calling for appropriate help when necessary. That is the role of the mast cell in our borders, our skin, our gut, our respiratory tract, our urogenital tract. Basically, you, and a lot of people have a tendency to focus on eating, but you may eat three or four times a day. You breathe 18 times per minute and your body skin is always exposed to the environment. So you need to be able to keep out things that are harmful to you and allow things that are helpful for you to come in. Unfortunately, when it comes to thinking about our defense and our repair systems, mast cells usually do not get mentioned. So you have our anatomic barriers, our ability to change our temperature and our pH in order to maintain that homeostatic balance. We have inflammatory mediators if there's some type of breach to our borders, whether or not our skin, our gut, or our respiratory tract. And then you have immune cells. And typically, the cells that get mentioned are the ones that we can easily detect in the blood, including natural killer cells, macrophages, and lymphocytes. But, and again, this focuses on our adaptive immune compartment, but in the, the innate immune compartment, you have white blood cells, proteins like complement, uh, as well as the structures uh, including the mucosa that act as our defensive systems. But however, it is this cell, the mast cell, which has all these granules that have the ability to dictate what kind of immune response gets called in, has the ability to deactivate uh, chemicals such as that derived from stinging insects or manufactured such as chemicals from medications such as anesthetics or injectable fluids, which may cause the body to go out of balance, and the mast cells are there to detect and respond accordingly. So I'm going to label the mast cells as our first responders. They are our border patrol. They are isolated sentries stationed in every single organ system, and they are armed with various sensors to detect things that they know are foreign to us and potentially dangerous, and they have a barrage of chemicals that can be utilized to contain that danger once the mast cell recognizes the entity. As I had said before, mast cells are not found in the blood. 
which may have led to the uh, delayed diagnosis of many patients that have mast cell dysregulation. So you can easily detect lymphocytes, eosinophils, macrophages in the blood, but when it comes to looking for, t for mast cells, you have to look in the tissue directly. They act in direct communication with the collagen, with nerve fibers, with the blood vessels in order to coordinate not only defense, but tissue repair. And they are armed with sensors. And I'm going to just point out a few. No está trabajando. The total receptors, uh, complement receptors, estrogen receptors. So it's not unusual to find individuals who have immediate hypersensitivity reactions or allergic-like reactions to medications such as anesthetics during operations, pain medications, stinging insects. You'll have large local reactions to mosquito bites, for instance, and they have the ability to directly respond to these changes in the local environment. And then, depending on whether or not these cells think that they can contain the danger, they can recruit in help, either with the use of the connection with the small fibers of nerves or through neighboring uh, uh, immune cells, such as dendritic cells, and then they have the ability to recruit in the cells if they need help. They are born in the bone marrow. And I'm going to use the analogy of our police officers, brave men and women who join the police academy. They get their basic training, and then they get assigned communities to protect. Same thing with the mast cells. They get their initial training in the bone marrow, and then they are exported to different parts of the body, the brain, the spleen, the gastrointestinal tract, and they situate themselves right below the surface area in order to act as surveillance and an immediate response team. So using the analogy of the police officer, uh, if the police officer sees somebody who's down, they're going to call an ambulance. If they see somebody who's performing a crime, they might call in you know, the SWAT team or, or more help of armed individuals. If they see a fire, they might call the fire department. The same thing with the mast cells. If they see uh, bacteria, they might call in neutrophils. If they see uh, viruses, they might call in lymphocytes. If they see venom from a stinging caterpillar, a mosquito, flying insect, they might just try to take care of it by themselves. And this is important to try to understand because if you're trying to identify individuals that have dysregulation of their mast cell compartment, you're trying to look for the mediators that they release. And sometimes some of the reactions that occur don't require uh, the activity of the most common mediators released by mast cells, which is tryptase. For instance, an individual who has anaphylaxis due to a food such as peanuts or tree nuts or shellfish, you can look for a tryptase, which is an enzyme that are only found in mast cells, but mast cells don't release this enzyme during those type of reactions. So it's easily able to miss someone who has a mast cell dysfunction simply because you're looking for a mediator that does not participate in those type of reactions. So I'm gonna briefly talk about what mast cells are supposed to do and then I'm going to talk about what happens in individuals who have, for instance, a connective tissue disorder, such that the mast cells are misbehaving and potentially contributing to the pathology that's occurring in individuals that have Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. So what do mast cells supposed to do? So mast cell activation is defined by engaging different surface receptors such as the immunoglobulin receptors or the complement receptors, um, even estrogen receptors. So it's not unusual for women who have a pre-existing mast cell disorder for their symptoms to get worse when they go in or out of their menstrual period or they go from, from pre pubescence to, to having active menses or go into menopause. The severity of the reaction will depend on what the mast cell is seeing and in what condition uh, the encounter is happening. For instance, there are individuals that have IgE to peanut, but might not necessarily have an allergic reaction when they ingest peanuts simply because the body is in a more restful, tolerant state. However, if you have recurrent symptoms and you're able to detect an increase in the mast cell meteors, because we really don't look for the mast cell action in the tissue very often, um, and you respond to medications like diphenhydramine, loratadine, famotidine, or ranitidine, you now have a mast cell activation syndrome. 
So these are examples of individuals who have come through my office and some of the complaints that they mention about. And I have to tell you, on average, some patients suffer up to seven to 10 years before they get diagnosed with mast cell activation syndrome. So you have to start off with the fact that you're having recurrent symptoms, whether within a few days or a few weeks or even within years, where you have at least two organ systems that are impacted. So one woman was complaining the fact that change in temperature, for instance, like coming out of a pool, she would get hives and feel faint. We have another person who, who detected shellfish in the area who had experienced increased nasal congestion, scratchy throat, and also felt that they were about to pass out. We have another individual where literally it was just a change from going from outdoors into an air conditioning that they developed hives and again felt faint. So two different organ systems. And each one of these individuals felt better after getting diphenhydramine and famotidine along with the corticosteroid. So in order to decide whether or not you have mast cell activation syndrome, you have to have symptoms impacting at least two organ systems. You have to get better with medications that target mast cells, specifically histamine blockade, that either give you partial or complete response or improvement. And then the hardest part, in my opinion, is identifying uh, a activated mast cell mediator, either in the blood or in the urine, to diagnose the mast cell activation syndrome. And unfortunately, because of how much time doctors have to see patients, we have a tendency to just rely on one test. But generally speaking, if you want to identify an individual that has mast cell activation syndrome, you should have a tryptase and histamine level measured, get a baseline. And then if you have an acute symptoms or an acute exacerbation, it is important to measure those mediators within four to six hours after the acute exacerbation. So this picture depicts uh, a, a young boy, and I was allergist number 11 uh, by the time he was four years old. He had negative tests on allergy testing on many occasions. Um, and as it turns out, I had a little time to speak to the mother um, and identify that this boy actually had Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. So that was kind of like the blue pill in Matrix that opened my eyes to the various ways that mast cells can be activated other than allergies. And this is what typically happens with immune-mediated disorders. Practitioners have a tendency to send, or even patients have a tendency to go to individual specialties, and no one's really talking to each other, unlike this, this wonderful opportunity in Madrid. Um, and because of that, this serialization of outpatient visits, no one gets the big picture. So we have a tendency to focus on the trees as opposed to looking at the forest and identifying somebody who may have immune dysfunction. And then, once you determine that they have immune dysfunction, it is important to figure out why the immune system is dysregulated. So, the next thing to identify someone with a mast cell activation disorder is to try to identify medications that improve their symptoms. And I want to give a little focus to the tricyclic agents, such as amitriptyline, nortriptyline, and doxepin. These are agents that were originally used for mood disorders uh, by psychiatrists. And, and within the past, I would say, 20 or 30 years, that medication is underutilized by, by my neurology colleagues, by my uh, psychiatry co colleagues. But neurologists use it for pain syndromes. Interestingly enough, gastroenterologists use it for irritable bowel syndrome. And allergy immunology specialists use it for chronic skin conditions such as urticaria, flushing, and itch. So, and all of those may be mast cell derived. Also, we have the use of traditional Chinese herbal medicine in acupuncture and acupressure, leukotriene blockades such as um, Montelukast or Zofalukast, and an agent that we frequently use in the United States uh, for chronic urticaria and asthma that has an allergic component is a medication called amalizumab or Zolaire. And interestingly enough, in a lot of patients that have the Ehlers-Danlos phenotype, without other uh, immune dysregulation syndromes, do quite well with the use of amalizumab to kind of quiet down their mast cell compartment. Now, one of the roadblocks, again, to the diagnosis of mast cell activation syndrome in patients is that some of the medications that you take don't just have an active medication. There can easily be other fillers or preservatives, such as Benadryl has a violent pink color in the States. You have uh, fillers like lact uh, lactose, soy-based uh, chemicals as well, which can interfere with the active uh, ingredient uh, to quell your symptoms that are associated with mast cell-mediated uh, disorders. 
Another reason that you you may have a mast cell activation syndrome, but the medications are not working, is you have to remember that the mast cells have a job to do. They're supposed to respond to danger, and they're also supposed to help with the rebuilding and healing once an injury is sustained. And I use this example of a, a dog that's been trained to attack and is being restrained by a muzzle and a leash, but you can see he's still at attention. Similar to mast cells, by taking Benadryl, you might be restraining your immune system from going after something that you haven't detected yet, such as an inf a chronic infection, or you're in an environment where you have chronic exposure to either an airborne chemical that might be driving your immune system to go awry. The last part is to try to identify test results that uh, confirm that your mast cells are dysregulated. And again, remembering that mast cells are not in the blood, you're going to try to look for some circumstantial evidence suggesting that your mast cells are dysregulated. So the most sensitive marker is serum tryptase. Um, and I have to tell you, it's extremely difficult getting this, this uh, lab value in the emergency departments because a lot of emergency department physicians don't want to be responsible for this piece of data. But this is the most sensitive marker for mast cell dysregulation. And by the way, sometimes identifying mast cell activation syndrome is the same way of trying to identify someone who's had a cardiovascular event. Sometimes you need to take serial measurements to identify whether or not mast cells are misbehaving or dysregulated. And that would require getting a baseline and, again, checking for a tryptase at least four to six hours after you had some type of an acute change in your health. Also suggestive of mast cell dysregulation is serum and urine histamine levels and another mediator called prostaglandin. So if you look at prostaglandin D2, or 11-beta-F2-alpha, this is also strongly suggestive of mast cell dysregulation. Ultimately, the best way to kind of diagnose mast cell dysregulation is to look for mast cells in the tissue. And the most data actually exists in the bone marrow, but there's a substantial number of information uh, in the gastrointestinal tract. So I would strongly recommend, if you've undergone an endoscopy, for, or, or colonoscopy for either gastroesophageal reflux symptoms or chronic constipation or diarrhea, it would be important to go back and stain that tissue for mast cells and also to see whether or not there's any activation of the mast cells by looking for activation markers. And so to just highlight the difference, the pink slide to the right shows a normal mast cell. They don't like being clustered together. They're kind of like single centuries. They are round. Uh, to the left uh, is um, a, a biopsy from someone who has mastocytosis. And you can see that there are more than one mast cell in, uh, uh, by themselves. They're clustered. They also have a tendency to be spindle-shaped. So if they have upregulated activation markers, if they are spindle-shaped or they are clustered, that is pathognomonic for mast cell activation syndrome. So what is the roadblock to getting a diagnosis from the data standpoint? A lot of doctors don't know what to order. We don't know what a normal tryptase is. Um, you have to explain to the pathologist how to look for mast cells because they don't routinely do this uh, when they look at biopsies. And then, unfortunately, there's just not enough data to figure out what is a normal level of mast cells and what is an abnormal level of mast cells. But I would not deter that. I, this should not be a deterrent to you figuring out whether or not mast cells are contributing to your fatigue, your gastrointestinal distress, or your neurocognitive impairment. If you're having these symptoms, it's important to understand whether or not the mast cells are dysregulated or not. And if they aren't, if they are, it will be important to try to think about treatments to calm the mast cells down in order for you to feel better. So unfortunately, a lot of us have been taught that if we don't have the data, then you don't have anything. And uh, this was a quote uh, by an anonymous businessman who basically said, if you can't measure it, it doesn't exist. Or some, some practitioners will say, oh, you just have allergies. But most of the individuals that I have met, uh, including my daughter, um, will suffer for years um, from lack of acknowledgement from the medical community. And then and it's, it's not unusual for patients to be labeled with malingering, hypochondriasis, uh, conversion disorder, simply because the doctors don't know how to measure for mast cell dysregulation. <laughs>
So the, the true phrase actually comes from Lord Kelvin, where he said, if you can't measure it, you can't change it. So if you make an effort with the suggestions that I just made and identify whether or not mast cells are contributing to your, uh, to your conditions, then you might have a, a, a new roadmap to try to get better. Also, it's really important to understand that mast cells don't do their jobs by themselves, and sometimes some of the conditions that are associated with mast cell dysregulation are mimicking other conditions. So it's important to rule out other conditions that may look like mast cell activation syndrome. And I would like to highlight one in particular, that is the dysautonomic uh, condition, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. So these are the symptoms that are typically associated with individuals that may have POTS. And these are the symptoms that are associated with individuals that have mast cell activation syndrome. That's because nerves talk to the mast cells in the tissue, mast cells talk to the nerves uh, in the tissue. So it's important to identify what might be the more predominant uh, cell population that may be contributing to your symptoms. But again, you don't want to get, focus on individual trees, but the dialogue that's going on within the tissue itself. So again, for diagnosis of mast cell activation syndrome, do you have at least two or more organ systems? Do you get better with medications like histamine blockers? And what, does, what data or test results supports that the mast cells are dysregulated? Once you once you determine your mast cells are dysregulated, which I often liken to that red light that comes on in your car, says check engine soon. If you're having itchiness, hives, headaches, irritable bowel syndrome-like symptoms, diarrhea, and constipation alternating, that just says something is wrong in your body. You need to better define what might be causing the mast cells to be dysregulated. And it's been broken down into intrinsic factors because just like you might have a rogue police officer, you might have a rogue mast cell that has sustained a mutation in either a major growth factor or one of the substances that gets released by the mast cells. That is an uncommon syndrome. Less than 200,000 people worldwide have mastocytosis or monoclonal mast cell activation syndrome. For the most part, it is secondary conditions like having IgE to peanut pollen mold uh, medications, or you have an autoimmune disorder such as uh, lupus. It's not, and it's not uncommon for allergists uh, to identify somebody who's had chronic hives and will find that they either have a chronic infection like hepatitis or Lyme, um, and then it is the mast cells, because they're itchy, identified uh, was a clue to look for another condition. And then you have individuals that have physical urticarias, such as cold-induced hives, uh, change in climate that causes you to go into anaphylaxis or have an asthma exacerbation. And what I find interesting about the physical urticarias and, some, and individuals that have a connective tissue disorder, again, this kind of reflects a miscommunication that's going on within the tissue between the peripheral nerve fibers, the mast cell compartment, and the connective tissue that those two organ systems service. So how do you treat mast cell activation syndrome? It all depends on what's driving the mast cells. So if it is a intrinsic problem, like you have a mutation in the mast cells, then using medications that target the mast cells are shown to be helpful. Histamine blockers, such as histamine receptor 1 blockers, such as loratadine, diphenhydramine, or histamine receptor 2 blockers, such as famotidine or cimetidine or using a, a, a biologic agent like uh, amelizumab. But again, it's really important that having an intrinsic problem with your mast cells is rare, and it's important to identify extrinsic factors, such as do you have a connective tissue disorder? Do you have a primary immune deficiency? Do you have an uncovered or undetected autoimmune disorder? And you need to address those other conditions in order to get your mast cell dysregulation under better control. So I want to focus a little bit more about connective tissue disorders. And I have to tell you, uh, that little boy I had mentioned before, um, I was allergy immunology specialist number 11. And I had to kind of revisit what I knew about connective tissue disorders, because that probably was one board question on my test two decades ago. Um, and so I came across uh, this passage by Dr. Symes, who queried whether or not 
uh, Ehlers Danlos was the key to collagen disorders, and he speculated regarding some of his patients why they would have ruptured cruciates in the springtime, or why they were having gastrointestinal distress during certain times of the year. Um, was there some type of pattern regarding mast cell dysregulation or neuropathic that would predispose these individuals? And what I found to be interesting uh, is that Dr. Symes is a veterinarian. And interestingly enough, we have uh, variants of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome in, in other than humans. And I have to tell you, um, when I was doing basic science with mice, and I wanted to make mice allergic, I would have to traumatize them before I can make them allergic to whatever I wanted to sensitize them to, including cheese. And that's the thing about the immune system. You have to have some type of form of injury to awaken the immune system to respond. And then they're going to look to see what they need to attack. And then if it keeps on seeing it, it will label it as a dangerous substance and continuing to attack it. So some further research, I was able to identify a paper back in 1977 that showed that individuals that had certain types of connective tissue disorders were much more likely to have mast cell dysregulation. And these, the individuals that were most sensitive in this paper, salud, was, salud, <laughs> was, was uh, Marfans and Ehlers-Danlos. And then uh, Dr. Castori, who is a geneticist in Italy, had mentioned that immune dysregulation happens in individuals that have Ehlers-Danlos. But the question is, what is the version, what is the phenotype, what is the cell population or populations that are involved in individuals that have uh, immune dysfunction in individuals that have connective tissue disorder? And I'm going to argue that the mast cells are leading the charge. So uh, shortly after I met uh, that little boy, uh, with the hypersensitivity reactions, who turns out has Ehlers-Danlos, so does his brother, so does his mother, so does his aunt and his cousin. I found nine individuals or ten individuals in my practice to see whether or not they had mast cell dysregulation that was contributing to their symptoms. And it, and it was very simple. It was just a questionnaire and reviewing a chart. But what I had found was that these individuals all had Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, all had anaphylaxis or asthma or rhinitis or chronic hives, and their IgE was undetectable, and their tryptase was normal, suggesting that there was another substance that was being released by the mast cells when they were triggered by physical challenges. And a little more fancier was this paper that came out in uh, 2016. So the group at National Institutes of Health identified families that had at least three generations of individuals who had a marker for hypersensitivity. And what they found in all of these families is they had a duplication or triplication of the tryptase gene, an enzyme that Dr. Thea Herides calls the meat tenderizer. And all three of these, all three, all of these families had either a duplication or triplication of the tryptase gene, and it was associated with the triad of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, hypermobile type, mast cell activation syndrome, and dysautonomia. This is an article from Mental Floss on a young lady who just found out about that discovery from the NIH, and she basically describes her life on a daily basis, and she finally had a name to her condition. So she had hypertryptasemia, which was again associated with subluxation of her joints, hypersensitivity reactions, neurocognitive impairment, easy bruising. And when she started focusing treatments on containing the dysregulated mast cell compartment, she was able to have a more normal existence. So where do we need to go from now? All I have to tell you, by coming to meetings like this and a facilitating crosstalk, we're able to identify better questions that need to be answered with more research to figure out what is the dysregulation in the mast cell compartment? How does this impact the surrounding nerve fibers and the connective tissue in order to address the sublocations, subluxations, the back problems, heart valve problems, food intolerances, not allergies, intolerances. Understand that foods have chemicals just like, you know, when you buy a cleaning agent. It's just a question whether or not those, those um, chemicals are tolerated by your body that's under a lot of stress.
And in order to kind of feel better, you need to get a better diagnosis, a better working diagnosis. You have to screen appropriately. You have to have targeted testing. You need to educate yourself and your family members in order to maintain that support and community. And then it really is all about prevention. And I use this asthma slide to suggest that, and here's the thing, asthma is a huge problem in the US, especially in urban environments. Um, and even the little boy who's a little bit heavyweight was able to feel better. So I'm going to wrap up with this comment uh, from Polly Matzinger, who is an incredible researcher who started off as a cocktail waitress in Los Angeles and now heads one of the major uh, immunology sections at the National Institutes of Health after one of the researchers said, hey, you asked some really good questions. You should go into graduate school. We all have an opportunity to not only help ourselves but pass it forward. And it starts with reducing the body stress which then allows you to res restore tolerance. And if you restore tolerance, the mast cells will stand down, and their impact on other organ systems will do so also. Thank you for your attention. Yes, hey, gratitude. Gracias.